You know, in my observation in life, I find that it's so easy to say that sometimes when you're with your brethren in times of fellowship like this. But you know, sometimes you have the tests, and when the test comes, there's no brother around or sister, and you're all alone. And the brother we have as our first speaker and certainly foremost speaker at this gathering this year is a man who has passed not only one but multiple tests and have stood. You know, there was an old prophet once that said, he described the scene of havoc, and he said that God had searched and he found no one to stand in the gap. Brigadier General Jack Moore has been a man, a prophet, a war horse, a watchman on the wall who has stood in the gap. And he has passed test after test, and there's been no one around to help his wounds. There was a time when he was preaching, when he was hit in the side of the face with a brick and knocked, busted his jaw and knocked his teeth out. And he stood up there with the guts of a prophet and preached for 45 more minutes. You cannot shut this man up. Amen. You know, I found that the churches run off their prophets normally. They want someone that's a little more po polished and a little more smooth, a little more diplomatic. They don't want to hear the loud barking of a watchdog. They don't want to hear the coarse cries of a prophet on the wall giving warning. But Jack has stayed in there in spite of personal injury, in spite of personal costs. I know for a fact that this man spends a lot of money out of his own pocket for the kingdom cause. He has been hounded by the FBI. He has been disowned by his brethren at times. I personally find comfort knowing that Brigadier General Jack Moore is in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, either typing something out on his typewriter, writing a book or a track, making another tape or planning another trip, tuning up his pacemaker, getting ready to go out, charge in there again. Where is Jack? <laughs> I got to thinking, you know, this be my luck. He would, wouldn't show up this one time. Well, I say it sincerely that I find comfort. I sometimes don't tell him that, but he you knows we all labor away on our own little fronts. It's comforting to me and reassuring to know that I've got a brother, a man like spiritual father like Jack Moore. I love Jack Moore, and I'm not ashamed to tell you he's my hero, and I want you to give him a good welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. I don't know what to say after an introduction like that. Do you still have that rope handy that you used last year, that lariat? Has he, has he gone already? Pete, you, you've still got that rope handy? All right. I don't know whether you noticed it or not, but... Well, before I say that, I'd like to say that I'm so happy to be here with you again. This year, I don't know how it's possible, but the women are prettier and the men look more intelligent than they did last year. <laughs> and I certainly am pleased to be here. I don't know whether you noticed it or not, but Peters and Jones did it to me again this year, just like they have practically every meeting I go to. Earl Jones shows up this afternoon, in the middle of the afternoon, hot afternoon, in a white shirt and a tie. Then he comes with a coat on tonight. He and Pete come with a... They both, they know I don't own a suit, so they do that to hurt my feelings. But down in the New Orleans area, recently the in crowd have come out and said that these Gaia Bear shirts, like I'm wearing tonight, are equal to a dress suit in the summertime. And so I'm going to be like a lot of Christians are today, I'm going along with the in crowd because it's easier and it's much more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I want to talk to you for a little while tonight on the subject of Christian warfare and use two verses of scripture out of 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 as a basis for what I have to say for you to, to you tonight. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. May we ask the Lord's blessing on this portion of the meeting. Our precious Father, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come before you tonight humbly, begging your help tonight and your strength and your wisdom as we speak to this great people of yours. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit might touch the lips of the speaker and the hearts of the listeners, that your name might be glorified and that your people might be strengthened, that we might honor and glorify thee in everything that we say and do, We'll be careful to praise you in the name of your precious son, Yahshua, our Christ and our Messiah and our elder brother. Amen. Now, it's quite obvious, I think, from the scripture that I read to you tonight that young Timothy was issued a call to war. The Apostle Paul was doing nothing more or less than to remind this young pastor that how easy it is for a Christian soldier to fail during the time of battle. And I believe that the Apostle Paul was writing not only to young Timothy, but he was also writing to other Christians down through the ages because all Christians have been called to war. And I think before I finish this message tonight that I will be able, or you will agree with me when I say that every individual man, woman, and child that has been born from above is called to war. Paul emphasizes this idea in the sixth chapter of Ephesians when he warns Christians to put on the whole armor of God. You don't put on armor when you're getting ready to go to bed. You don't put on armor when you're getting ready to retire to a foxhole. You put on armor before you go into a battle. And then in verse 12, he tells us some startling things. I want you to notice this because it's very important. He said, we wrestle not. That's what most Christians say today. We wrestle not, period. And they stop right there. But Paul went on to say that we wrestle not against principalities, uh, or against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And he was telling Christians uh, who these soldiers in the Lord's army should be. He was talking about everyone that was washed in the blood of the Lamb. Every saved person must be in the army of the Lord, and there are no exceptions. There are no four Fs in this. There can be no conscientious objectors in this war. There can be no fence-sitters because we are either in this war on the side of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or we're in the war on the side of the enemy. And then in the same verse, he tells us who the enemy is. It's not a flesh and blood enemy. It's not the Jews. It's not the aliens in all midst, although certainly they are part of the enemy force. I want you to notice the enemy is a plural enemy. Notice what he said. The rulers of the darkness of this world, many, Spiritual wickedness in high places, plural, many places. Now that word ruler is a very interesting word in the Greek language. It is called cosmokratos, 2888, which means a world ruler. This is the spiritual name that was given to a person that is sometimes called Satan in the word of God. The word high means in the heavens. Spiritual comes from the Greek word pneumatikos, which means demonic. And the word wickedness in the Greek language means depravity or malice or iniquity. So we see that Christians have a major adversary. It's not a flesh and blood adversary, but it's a very powerful spiritual force that's utterly depraved and utterly sent, sent against God himself. And this is further confirmed in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, where we are told, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That word war comes from a Greek word that means to serve in a military campaign. For the weapons, the, the things that we arm ourselves with in Greek of our warfare, and here it's talking about military warfare, are not carnal weapons. They're not fleshly weapons. But they're mighty through God for the pulling down. And here the word pulling down means the destruction of the strongholds, which actually means the fortified places of the enemy. And we could very easily translate that into modern English, and it would come out something like this. For though we walk in the natural world, we do not serve in a military campaign after the flesh. For the weapons with which we arm ourselves are not fleshly weapons, but they're mighty through God for the destruction of the enemy's fortified places. Isn't that a marvelous scripture when you think of it in that, in that way? 
So what we literally see from this scripture is that all those that have had a born-again experience, although we walk in fleshly bodies, we do not carry on our major military campaign in these bodies. The reason being that the weapons of, these, of this military warfare are not fleshly weapons. They're not guns and tanks and, and uh, 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 missiles and so on. They are very powerful weapons, however. They're capable weapons. Through God's help, they demolish the strongholds of the enemy. My, my, what a power we have available to us if he'll only use it. This enemy we face is a spiritual enemy. He is many. He is a government. He is an organization of spiritual beings. Our enemy in this spiritual realm is sometimes called Satan, sometimes called other things. And we who are born from above are in spiritual warfare against this spiritual enemy, whatever you want to call him. People who are not the children of God, and this includes millions and millions of church members who go by the name of Christian, but who have never had the born from above experience. They've only had a superficial experience with Jesus Christ. They aren't called into this war for the simple reason they cannot fight because they are still spiritual prisoners of this spiritual authority. A prisoner of war cannot fight. He is out of the battle as far as the fight is concerned. And a person that has not had this born-again experience with Jesus Christ is in the enemy camp as far as being a prisoner of war is concerned, and he cannot get involved in this fight. I think that's one of the reasons why there is such a lack of effort on the part of the organized church, the Judeo-Christian churches, if you want to put it that way, to fight this enemy. Because too many of their members are prisoners of war. They may come to church every Sunday. They may put something in the collection plate. They may even praise God every once in a while. But they're as much a prisoner of the adversary as if they were locked up behind steel and concrete. And these people are worthless in the kingdom of God. I sometimes call them Alka-Seltzer Christians. You know, if you take a glass of water and you put an Alka-Seltzer in it, it fizzes for a few seconds, you've got to drink it while it's fizzing, otherwise it won't do you any good. And there are a lot of people in our churches who come to church Sunday morning, they fizz for an hour on Sunday morning, the rest of the week you'd never even know they're Christians. They go to the same places the ungodly people go to, they use the same language, they do the same things. You can't even tell that they're Christian. In 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26, we are told that one of the tasks of the servant of the Lord is to instruct these people to repentance, to the acknowledgement of the truth, that they may recover themselves from having been taken in a snare by the will of the adversary. In other words, they must actually be able to get out of the trap of Satan because they've been captured alive by him. They're prisoners of the war. They cannot get out of this prison by themselves. I remember hearing a story uh, one time, or uh, this story, an actual experience that happened in Africa when I was over there in 1962. I had the privilege of going out into the boondocks and listening to a young black boy that had been raised in one of the church missions down there as he preached to a large group of natives way out in the boondocks. They were so far out in the sticks that they'd never seen a white man before. They thought that I had white paint on my skin and the women were coming up and trying to rub the white paint off to see if I wasn't black underneath. And this young man preached a message and he gave an illustration that I've never forgotten. He talked about two monkeys out in the jungle tossing a, a coconut back and forth between them and one of them made a mistake and dropped the coconut. It fell down into a mud hole and without thinking he jumped into the mud hole after it and he got stuck. And as he began to sink in the quicksand, he got panicky, and he called to his friend to help him. His friend said, no, I can't do it, because if I try to help you, I'll get stuck and sink myself. Pull yourself up. So we see the monkey grabbing a hold of his whiskers, yanking on his whiskers, and the more he struggles, the faster he sinks. And in a little while, there's nothing but a few bubbles on the top of the water. That young man said, that's what's happened to us. We've got caught in the swamp of sin. We're sinking in the quicksand of sin, and our friends can't help us to get out. We can't get out ourselves. We try, and the more we struggle, the faster we sink. And then Boana Jesus, Master Jesus, comes by, and he says, sees our predicament. And he holds his hand down to us and says, Son or daughter, I'd like to help you out of the mess you're in, but I can't help you unless you're willing to reach up and take a hold of my hand so that I can pull you out. Have you ever had that experience of taking a hold of the Master's hand and having him pull you out of that swamp? I did one day in a, in a Korean prison. I've never been sorry for it since then. And these people can't escape the prison by themselves. 
You see, I think that what we see that these people today are trying to do their own thing and they think that they're going to be able to get right with God by doing what they want to. It won't work that way. This means that in order to be a good soldier in the army of the Lord, we have to have a personal knowledge of the commander-in-chief. I was up at the Aryan Nations meeting up there. I was very disturbed by some of the things that I saw up there because there was a great lack of spirituality in some of the speakers that spoke up there. And when I spoke on Saturday morning, I said this one thing to him. I said, there are a lot of you fellows out there that are awful tough. And I said, you're well trained. And you got all sorts of guns and ammunition and all sorts of food supplies. And you think that you're self-sufficient. But I want to tell you something, my friend. Unless you have a personal knowledge of the commander in chief, the king himself, when you get into the fight, you're going to fall flat on your face without a knowledge of the commander in chief. You've got to know him and trust him in order to be able to fight. And I'm getting a little bit sick and tired. I'm getting a little bit sick and tired of these loudmouths going around and telling what we're going to do when we get up against the enemy. Because in every case that I have seen recently, particularly in the identity grouping, these are the fellows that have been the first ones to go over into the enemy camp and squeal on their own people. Look at Fort Smith if you don't believe that. A very, very unfortunate thing. So one of the principal reasons that Jesus, the Word of God, came into this world in human form was to preach deliverance to the captives. Luke 4 and 18. That word deliverance comes from a Greek word that means forgiveness, pardon, liberty. The word captives refers actually to a prisoner of war. Number 164 in Strong's Concordance. Now where do you think that the fleshly lusts come from that bombard the average men and women and cause them to stumble? Somebody says, well, it's the old human nature coming to the surface. I remember hearing a story one time about an old Indian man who was asked this question. And he said, well, it's like there were two big dogs inside of me that are fighting all the time. One's a black dog and the other's a white dog. And they're fighting against each other all the time. And somebody said, well, which one of the dog wins? He said, the one that I say sick them to. Well, isn't that sort of true, the way we are too? You see, the, the force in our life that we, that we encourage some people say, oh, that's the old human nature coming. The devil made me do it. No, he didn't at all. The devil didn't make you do it at all. But why is it that all flesh is basically evil? The Bible tells us there's none good that doeth good. No, not one. Now, how do we fight this evil thing anyway? Well, through the flesh. We're told over in, Second to, or in Titus 2 and 11. For the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world, right now, folks. Not sometime in a heavenly world to come. Some of you may be a little bit skeptical about this and say, do you mean to imply that all human nature and sin and human failure is caused by evil spirits that work in the lives of people? I didn't say that. But it might be well for us to look in the Bible and see what it says. Now, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there are many, many prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it talks about a thousand year reign actually on this earth, which is properly called the millennium. You can read about it in the 20th chapter of Revelation. In Isaiah 2 and 4, we read that during this period, there is going to be no war. It will be the first time in over 6,000 years of written history that this whole world has been without war. In Isaiah 11 and 6, we are told that the natural enemies in the animal kingdom will be at peace with each other. The lion and the lamb will get along together during this period of time. The baby will be able to play with the poison rattlesnake without fear. Now, we know that there are going to be unsaved men and women on this earth during this period, and they are going to be administered to by Jesus Christ and by the overcomers. Now, this does not include all Christians because all Christians are not overcomers. You read about that in Revelations 2 and 26, and it tells you what you've got to do in order to become an overcomer. All pain and agony of life will be missing during this millennial reign. Commerce and world business will go on, but there'll be one difference. Evil influence will be gone out of the world. And there's some rather picturesque language that you can read in the 20th chapter of Revelation where it tells you how this evil influence is taken out. And then it states a little farther on in Revelation 20 that at the end of this thousand year time, this evil influence is going to be turned loose for a little while. And what's it going to do? It's going to go right back to deceiving men and women again and leading them to doing evil. And we that are servants of the Lord are at war with this evil empire. Now, 
This is a covert war. Now, by a covert war, we mean it's an undercover war. Even though many people don't recognize it as a war, it is a war. This is one of the reasons we fight the battle from the day to day and why Jesus warned us when he said, Take no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Matthew 6 and 34. And this spiritual warfare has one goal, and that is to extinguish and destroy Christian life. This is how it works. When a person becomes a real Christian, I mean when a person repents of their sins, when they accept Jesus as their Savior, when they've been baptized for the remission of sins, at that moment a light goes on in their life which shines in a darkened world. This is the light that leads prisoners of war to Jesus Christ, the liberator. And it's because of this that the Christian becomes a threat to the jailer. According to 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the eyes of them that believe not, listen carefully now, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And you see, my friend, when your witness goes out and shines in the world as it should be, then spiritual prisoners who are POWs of the enemy see a chance for liberty through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ acknowledged this in John 10, 9 and 10 when he said, I am come that I may set them, the spiritual prisoners, free that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Over in Romans 8 and 14, we are led, we read that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save they which were lost. In this particular incident, he happened to be talking about lost Israelites. He wasn't talking about the world as a whole in this particular place. Now, spiritual warfare is always carried on on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, some people will disagree with me on this, but I, from my own personal experience, I sort of believe in a personal devil as I believe in a personal savior because I've had so many skirmishes with this rascal or whatever it is that has given me a lot of hard time during my Christian life. This evil force is always designed to destroy the Christian light and destroy the Christian witness. So the enemy of God becomes the enemy of the Christian. Listen carefully now. The enemy of God becomes the enemy of the Christian. Turn over in your Bibles, if you will, to me, to the 139th Psalm, verses 20, uh, 21 and 22. David speaking now. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with them that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them as my enemies. Listen to me, my friend, the enemy of God automatically becomes the enemy of the Christian. There's no such thing as this thing that you must hate the sin and love the sinner because the Bible tells us that you must hate the person that takes a stand against God. You can no more love them than you can love a mad dog that attacks your child out on the streets. It's impossible for you to love the enemies of God because automatically they become your enemies. Now, the first phase of this spiritual warfare that's Paul speaks about in Ephesians 6 is to destroy the Christian witness, and that's done by manipulating circumstances around each one of you so that you're confronted with temptations that are aimed specifically at weaknesses that you have. We all have them, some one way, some the other. Maybe it's pride in some of us. Maybe it's love of money. Maybe it's personal power, so on and, and so forth. I guess probably a good example of that would be the problems that Jimmy Swaggart had and the Bakers had uh, recently that uh, shows you how they can be nip uh, people that are supposed to be Christians can be manipulated into that. In a moment of personal weakness such as this led one of the greatest men in the Bible into a mess that hounded him all his life. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Here we have a man that was called a man after God's own heart, a man by the name of David. And he was a king at this time. And it said, and it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbit. But notice carefully this next sentence. But David tarried still in Jerusalem. There was the beginning of David's downfall right there. He stayed in Jerusalem when his job was to be with his men out on the battlefront. And he wasn't out there where he was supposed to be. And you remember the story how as the night when he was there, when he should have been out fighting with his men, 
he was up in the cool of the evening strolling on the roof and he happened to look over and there on another roof was a beautiful woman taking a bath. Now I don't think that there's anything wrong with a man being uh, thrilled by the sight of a beautiful woman. I think probably that's natural for most people and it can be done without a man having evil thoughts at all because God made women very beautiful and made them for a special purpose. But David looked there and instead of turning his head away, it said that he looked and gazed upon her and he wanted her and he ended up committing adultery with her. He gulped down the bait, hook, line, and sinker. He didn't discipline himself. And you know what happened to him? Turn over again, if you will, with me to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12 and let's see. Yeah, second, second uh, Samuel chapter 12, starting with verse 9. And here is where Nathan is coming and talking to David after he committed his sin. Wherefore hast thou despised the command of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah, he murdered for this woman. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Listen what God said to him. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house because thou hast despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy life. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise up against thee, uh, evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto their neighbors, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son, for thou didst this secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. That's what the Lord said. Be sure your sin will sign you out. And what happened as a result of that one moment of indiscretion on the part of, of, of uh, David? He had a son that raped his own sister. He had another son that killed his brother because of the act. He had another son that tried to assassinate him. And if you have followed the story of David from that time on until the time that he died, this sin followed him to the grave, all because of the fact that he refused to turn his head away from a temptation. So listen, my Christian Israelite brother and sister, guard your Christian light. It's the most important thing you have. We've seen these recent shameful spectacles of what's happened to people that are professing Christians on television and how it has hurt the cause of Jesus Christ and what embarrassment has come about it. And I believe that Christians that refuse to become involved in this battle have never been born from above. I think their actions prove that to it. I think that these are the people that Jesus talked about when he said, ye are the salt of the earth. But when the salt has lost its savor, its ability to act as salt, it then becomes good for nothing but to be thrown out on the garbage heap and trodden under the feet of men. Why? Because when the salt loses its ability to hold back corruption, it's good for nothing. That's what's happened to many, many people in our churches today that go by the name of Christian. Now, how do we go about this Christian warfare? Well, first, we've got to be very careful on a daily basis to put on the whole armor of God. It's given in Ephesians 6. You know what it is. Our enemy is a very, very wily enemy, by the way. And don't ever go into combat and leave one part of your armor off because that's the place he's going to shoot at. If you don't have your shield, he'll shoot at your, at your chest. If you don't have your helmet, he'll shoot at your head. If you leave the protection on your legs off, he'll shoot at your legs. He's very wily that way. These pieces of armor are truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the only weapon that we have, which is the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Now, many, many people think that this is a superficial sort of a thing, but it will give perfect protection if you're willing to use it. I think this shield of faith is probably the most important of all. There are four parts to the shield of faith. First, there is intellectual faith. Now, intellectual faith is the part that we use when we search for salvation. Unfortunately, however, you can have intellectual faith and not be saved. You may know how to be saved. You may know about the Savior. You may even want to be saved. And you may even know of the necessity of being saved. And you may not do anything about it. The second part in the faith process is found in Romans 10, 9 and 10. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in his heart, thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, the intellect, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This means you must publicly declare your faith. You can't be saved and hide it under a bushel from your fellow men. 
In other words, it's impossible for you to be a closet Christian. You can't be a Christian and keep it to yourself. It must be told to other people. The third part of faith is temporary faith. And you remember we had an example of that over in Luke 8 and 6 where Jesus told the story of the sower who went out to sow the seed and how some of the seed fell on rocky ground. The rain came and it sprouted, but it didn't last very long because it died from lack of nourishment. And here's what he explained, how he explained this in verse 11. They, the seed on the rock, are they who when they hear receive the word with joy, yet they have no root. For a little while they believe, and then during a time of temptation they fall away. As an evangelist for 19 years, I saw this happen many, many times. I would see people in a fundamental uh, revival meeting get all worked up by the message. They would come forward. Some of them would shout and dance around in front of the, uh, of the uh, altar. They might even become a professor of being a Christian. And then when they got back into the world and the enemy fired a few shots at them, they got scared and they ran from cover and they never recovered after that. I'm sure some of you have seen that. I remember one time back in the old days when we used to go knocking on doors and uh, knocking on the door one time an old elderly man, uh, well, he was younger than what I am now, but he was elderly. And uh, he said to, <laughs> at least I thought he was at that time, and I said to him, are you a Christian? He said, well, I reckon I am. I, I went forward uh, one time 43 years ago when Brother so-and-so was holding the revival meeting out in the schoolhouse, and I got baptized. Well, I inquired around a little bit, and that old fellow had never been in the church since then, excepting to an occasional wedding and maybe to a funeral or maybe on Christmas or Easter somewhere. He showed no signs of the fruit of the Spirit in his life. He was evidently one of those fellows where he sprouted up for a little while and then temptation came along, he forgot about it. Then there's the fourth type of faith, and that's called by the Apostle James dead faith. It's found in Second or James 2.17. Even so, faith, if it is without works, is dead. Remember that. You can boast all you want to about your faith. You can claim to be a Christian, but if your life doesn't show that, the Bible tells us that when you become a Christian, all things are passed away and all things become new. What does that mean? Well, listen to me, my friend. It means that if you're running around with the same old crowd and using the same old ungodly language and telling the same dirty stories and doing the same ungodly things that you did before you were saved, you don't got the right thing. You maybe got something all right, but it's not Christianity. Now, don't get mad at me. That's, what that, that's words coming right out of the Word of God. So you might say to me, well, what is faith? Let's go to the Bible and see what it says. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Where does this faith come from? Romans 10 and 7. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing cometh by the Word of God. You might say, how can I obtain this saving faith? And again, we read in Romans 12 and 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God dealt to every man a measure of faith. When we read Christ's parable of the sower in Luke 8, we find that intellectual faith makes up about 25% of those who hear the gospel. Another 25% have temporary faith. Another 25% have dead faith. And only about one in four, the people that hear the word, ever come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. From my experience, dealing with people for over 25 years, I believe that's true. Maybe that's even a little bit high sometimes. Then this final 25% that hears the word and does something about it is further divided. It's divided into those that produce 30-fold, those that produce 60-fold, and those that produce 100-fold. And when the time comes and Christians get under fire from the enemy, the Bible says that there aren't going to be very many who are going to remain as overcomers and will be able to serve with him in his kingdom as the rulers in his kingdom. Now I want to look for just a moment at this marvelous weapon that we have, the sword of the spirit, our only offensive weapon. We have no other offensive power in ourselves, and that's something that a, a lot of identity Christians need to lear learn real fast because, listen folks, we in identity are headed towards catastrophe if we think that we have any kind of a weapon other than that found in Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no other. 
Now, now, how do we go about using this weapon? The Bible says we should have the faith of a little child. Let me explain it this way. The story is told of a little boy who in the middle of a terrible storm that was rocking the house on its foundations climbed into his daddy's arms in fear and said, Daddy, are we going to die? And his father hugged him and said, No, son, everything's going to be all right. God's going to take care of us. And the little fellow said, Okay, Daddy, in that case, I'm going to bed. That's the kind of faith I'm talking about, you see. Knowing that when we read over there in Romans 8 and 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose, it means exactly what it says. And that even if you have sorrow come into your life, and even if you have all sorts of disagreeable things come into your life, that if you are in Christ Jesus and have been called by him, that bad thing that you think is so bad someday is going to be turned around and used against or for you. Oh, I can remember those terrible, terrible days when I was in a POW camp and, and I was being misused by those people and I didn't think I was ever going to make it out alive. And I, didn't, I thought my mind was going to crack up under it. And I remember saying over and over again, God, why me? Why are you doing this to me? I know I've been a bad individual. I know I haven't done what I was supposed to be, but why me? Why did you pick on me? I didn't realize until almost 30 years later that God was preparing me for the kind of work I'm doing right now. I didn't realize that. And I can go back and... I can go back and see time and time and... And time again where things came in my life that seemed to be like this was the end. I remember when I first began to know about the, about the Zionist truth and about the Israel truth. And I began to speak about it. And I was immediately ostracized in the churches where I had preached for years and years. I was practically kicked out of the Baptist churches around the country, almost 100% of them. And I thought, oh, God, this is the end of it. You know something? Since that period of time... I've been busier than I ever have been, and I've been blessed more than I ever have been since I began to speech, preach the truth that was in this book here. And God was using those times, you see. And I can remember when Pete Peters, when I first met Pete Peters, and we ran into all sorts of trouble in his church with a little meeting that we had there, and Pete said, Jack, why in the world would you ever get me involved in this mess that we're in right here? And now Pete Peters knows why God got him involved in that mess and why old... <laughs> Now, I look back on Jack Moore, and I, back before I was, became a Christian, and I can't see anything worthwhile in Jack Moore at all. I'd be ashamed to stand up here and tell you some of the things I did, because I guess outside of maybe murdering somebody or getting involved in drugs, I tried just about everything that I shouldn't have. And I'm not, not, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm not bragging about it at all, because I'm ashamed of it. And I can't understand why God, in his mercy, picked an old reprobate like Jack Moore from before the foundation of the earth to be a watchman on the walls of Jerusalem. But I praise his name for it. Hallelujah! You see. And I'm sure that there are some of you that can look in your lives too and can say the same thing. I can't understand why Yahweh God chose me to be one of his people, but thank God he did. I want to tell you, when you have that knowledge in your, in, your, in, your, in your very being, in the very inside of your heart, oh, you ought to go out with a, on fire to see that this message is spread to other people. And since this sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon we have, we've got to know how to use it. This means practicing with it. You know, a man has never held a sword in his hand before. He can have the most beautiful blade that he's ever seen. It can be made out of Damascus steel. It can have a gold hilt with diamonds and rubies set in it. It can be the finest weapon that you could have as far as a sword is concerned. And he can go up against a fellow that's practiced. It's got nothing but a plain old iron sword and the guy with the old iron sword will whip the tire out of him every time. Why? Because he doesn't know how to use his weapon. So as Christians we know, need to go on how to use our weapon. It doesn't mean that we're compelled to surrender when temptation comes up against us, but we need to know that we have the alternative way out. Oh, I'm, I've been so disappointed sometimes when I've seen some of the things that have been happening to our young people. A few years ago, I was at Ohio State University, and I was speaking on abortion. During the question and answer period, a very beautiful co-ed jumped up and said, Colonel Moore, if we can't have 
abortions and contraceptives, how are we going to stop the uh, population explosion in the world? And I said, honey, have you ever heard of anything called self-control? And you would have thought by the reaction of that crowd of seven or 800 young people that I had slapped that girl right across the mouth. They couldn't get across through their heads why a mature individual would ever ask a young person to have self-control. Why? Because they had been taught by the mental child molesters in their university, in their college, that everything that they did came about through their, uh, their uh, circumstances and their environment, and they had nothing to say whether it, things were right or wrong. And here were young people just getting ready to go into life. They didn't even know that they had the opportunity of making a choice between what was good and bad. Isn't that sad? And then I found out that that young woman that was so strong pro-abortion was the head of an organization that was trying to protect baby seals up in Newfoundland. Think about the hypocrisy of that. You've seen it. Young people, older people, they want to protect baby seals, but they don't see anything wrong in murdering unborn human babies, you see. This is the sort of thing that is taught, you see, today in our humanist. You might say, well, if God is in control of the world, why would he allow me to be tempted? Well, the same reason why, if you're a, a little baby and you stay in the crib and never have anything but a bottle to suck on, and you never get out and get any mental or physical exercise, you're going to turn into a mental and physical imbecile. You're never going to grow. You've got to change from the bottle over to, to a little meat every once in a while. And you're going to have to get out and exercise. And you're going to have to have things that are come against you that will try out your muscles. That's what happens to a Christian. And the price that we pay when we allow evil to manipulate our lives is always very, very high. Christian soldiers may very well be called on sometimes to use physical weapons. We are not called on specifically to use physical weapons, but it's happened time and time again. With the ancient Israelites, it's happened in modern times, back in our War of Independence, when we had to take up physical weapons in order to have the right to use the spiritual weapons that God had given to us. But we need to be careful that when we do this, we know that we are not pushing ahead of God, that we are doing it on his timetable and not his. And I rather suspect sometimes that some of these people that talk about violence, and some of you have read some of the newsletters that have come out recently where men are advising their people to take their weapons and go out in the streets and start killing people. I want to tell you, my friends, I don't see any of those leaders out there doing it. They are telling their followers to do it, and they'll stand far behind them while this is going on and while they're getting in trouble. But the interesting thing about it is that they are almost tempting God and pushing him ahead as though they're saying, God, your timetable is too slow for me. We're going to shove things up a little bit, and maybe we can put you in a position where you'll come back and save us. It ain't going to work that way. It's not going to work that way. Now, I want you to remember something. When Jesus Christ was on earth, he was God in the flesh. He was the word made incarnate. When he departed, he left us with his written word, which we call the Bible, the word of God. I want you to remember that. The next time you pick up this book, this precious book, and open it up, you are holding in your hands the very essence of the Son of God. So be careful of it. Don't be like the young mother that was trying to impress the pastor who was visiting her the first time. They were sitting there drinking coffee, and she said to her little four-year-old daughter, Susie, go get the big book Mama loves so well. And Susie came trotting into the Sears Roebuck catalog. Don't do that sort of thing. I want to tell you, my friends, remember that if the printed word of God is used as it should, it'll have the same effect as if the living word of God was speaking it. Remember that. And that when you speak these words to someone else, you are speaking in, through the lips of Jesus Christ himself. But the Bible can only become a weapon to those who believe in it. I have a very dear friend, or a man that I knew very well and respected a great deal. He was a great intellectual. He was a Christian, a professing Christian at one time. Somehow or another, down through the years, he lost his, he lost his faith. The day he refers to God as that big spook up in the sky, and he talks about the Bible being nothing but a bunch of Yiddish fairy tales, he can't see any good in the Bible anymore. He can't see any virtue in it. Why? Because he's allowed blind leaders to guide him. You know what the Bible says? When the blind lead the blind, both of them will fall into a ditch. 
He's like a man that goes to a doctor and says, Doc, I can't see. Can you help me? And the doctor says, of course you can't see, you poor fool. Open your eyes and maybe you can see. You can't see as long as your eyes are closed, you see. Now, if you want to have concrete proofs as to whether this Bible is legitimate or not, I could spend another hour here telling you about it. I just want to tell you a couple of stories here that you might find interesting. A few years ago, I had an interesting debate with a professor from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in New Orleans, and uh, it was a debate regarding the first 10 chapters of the book of Genesis. He, he said he had written a book called The Genesis Story, in which he said that they were nothing but Jewish fairy stories. The fact that there were not even any people by the name of Jews back in those times, didn't, he didn't even register with him, but he said they're nothing but Jewish fairy stories, and that, the, for instance, the crossing of the Red Sea could be explained very easily because there were certain places in the Red Sea where the water uh, is called the Sea of Reeds, where the water never got over ankle deep, and periodically the east wind would blow the water away and you could walk across on dry ground. I asked him if he'd ever been to the Red Sea. He said no. I said, well, I've been from the north end of it to the south end seven different times, and I never saw any place where the main channel was less than 40 foot deep. Oh, he said, you fellows always have an answer for everything, don't you? And then I asked him, if, if it's true what you say, how can, how can you account for the fact that uh, Pharaoh's horses and riders were drowned in water that was only ankle deep? The Bible says that they got stuck in the mud and the wall stood up as a wall, uh, the water stood up as a wall on either side and came down and, and drowned them. Well, he said, that's another one of those fairy stories. I said, have you ever been to Cairo? He said, no, I never have. I said, you ought to go there sometime. And you ought to go to the great museum that they have there, the Egyptology Museum. It's a building probably twice as big as this room here, carved out of solid granite. And around the wall are little niches that are about the size of a, an ordinary door. They're maybe 18 inches deep that are carved in these solid granite walls. And in each one of them is a pharaoh, a mummy of a, a, of a pharaoh that served in uh, Egypt at some time or another. And underneath is a brass plaque giving his name, the date when he served, and some interesting things about his reign. And you go around and there's Every one of them is filled up until you come to one that's empty, and underneath it is a brass plaque, and the date is 1491 B.C., and it says, this is the Pharaoh that pursued the children of Israel into the Red Sea. And they never found him. They only him one. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Why don't these intellectuals want to believe that? Because the Bible says the God of this world has blinded their eyes lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. I want to tell you, my friends, when you have access, when you hold this weapon in your hand, you have access to a weapon that puts a nuclear power to shame because you have the access to God there. It's just like when you want the power from the power supply, what do you do? You go over and flip the switch on the wall and all the power in the power station is available to you when you flip that switch. But nothing is going to help you and you're not going to get any power in your life till you flip the switch. You've got to do that. Amen. You remember back when there used to be streetcars, I'm sure many of you do. You remember how in the back of the streetcar there was an arm with a copper wheel on the back of it and many times when it would get full of people and get up, going up a steep hill, the thing would go sort of like that. The reason was that the maintenance man didn't keep the copper wheel polished like he should. And there were corroded spots on it. When it hit a corroded spot, it lost the power. The power was in the power line that ran over the street. That's like in a Christian life. Our power is in the Holy Spirit. And when we allow sin to corrode the contact points between us and the power supply, we can't get the power into our life. And when we don't have the power in our life, that's when the enemy hits every time. Don't ever kid yourself. Sometimes we blame God for these things, but God never is to blame for these things at all. These are things that we set up ourselves. Over in Deuteronomy 11, we find a promise that is still in effect with the Israel people. Behold, I, God, set before you, Israel, this day a blessing, a curse, a blessing if you obey, and a curse if you do not obey. And listen to me, my friend. Even Christian people that sin have to pay the penalty for that sin. That's known as the law of harvest. It's found over in Galatians 6 and 7, written to Christian Israelites, for Christian Israelites, about Christian Israelites. Be not deceived. Don't be fooled. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. 
and we have the illustration of a man who's getting ready for deer hunting and he's cleaning his rifle in the kitchen normally he's a very careful man so he opens up the boat of uh, to see whether there's a round in the chamber or not and there's not a round in the chamber so he pushes the bolt forward and starts to clean his rifle and it goes off there was a round down in the magazine that he didn't check and it kills his wife working at the kitchen stove across the room and the police come in and they say it wasn't homicide because he didn't meant to mean to kill his wife and he's exonerated but it doesn't bring his wife back does it you see because there's a penalty when you do something like that and so we need to remember that. That's why it's so important that our Christian life, it, it, that we keep as close to God as we, as, we, as we can. Don't expect to go to heaven on the flowery beds of ease. I can't understand these Christians today that seem to think that they can live like the devil. And before things get very bad, Jesus is going to come back and they're going to get in some kind of a spacecraft or something and go sailing on off into heaven where all this bad thing is going on down in the earth here. You can't find that. It's not scriptural at all. And yet they sing in their churches a song that goes something like this. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? No, I must fight. If I would reign, increase my courage, Lord, to bear the toil, so endure the pain supported by thy word. And you know, my friends, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of Israelites who are going to make it into, kingdom, into the kingdom by the skin of their teeth. That's what the Apostle Paul said, they're going to be saved as by fire. Why? Because the building material that they sent forward was hay and wood and stubble instead of precious stones and gold and silver. A lot of our fundamental friends like to sing a song that says, I want, a, I want a mansion just over the hilltop. I want a mansion with silver line. And they're going to get to heaven and they're not going to have a silver line mansion because they didn't send mansion material ahead to build that mansion. And Paul says that they're going to suffer loss in eternity. Can you believe that? That they'll suffer loss in eternity because of the fact that the building material that they sent forward was the wrong building material. Our modern churches don't know very much about the fire that fell on the day of Pentecost. I want to tell you today that we see in, in, in people like the Bakers and Swaggerts that they, uh, they say I'm saved and that's all that's mattered. I want to tell you, my friends, no matter how much they holler and jump around, there is more to the fire of Pentecost than that. Because when the fire of the Holy Spirit gets into the life of men and women, it's going to change them and set them on fire as soldiers of Jesus Christ. And they're going to go out and grab the enemy by the horns and defeat him. You see, one of the reasons why so many are, of our Christians today are twinky, wishy-washy, marshmallow Christians is because they've never been tried by fire. They've never been tested. And when they begin to love their, to, to lose their first love for Jesus Christ, they lose their fear, their respect for God. And what does he become? He becomes sort of a grandfatherly figure setting up on a fluffy cloud, long gray beard, long gray hair, strumming on his guitar and saying, oh, look at those little devils down there running around. Aren't they a bad little bunch? But I love them so much that I'm going to make sure that all of them get into my kingdom. Isn't that a sweet message? But that ain't what the book says. That isn't what the book says, you see. And the word of God tells us that we're going to have to take a stand. And so I come to you, my friends, tonight as one of the watchmen on the walls of America. I plead with you tonight, those of you that are Israel, Israelites in particular, I plead with you that you get your life in the proper relationship with the commander-in-chief. You can't do anything until you know the commander-in-chief. Some of you have heard me say, repeat this again, but I think it's worthwhile. You need to feel the touch of the hand of the master on your, on your heart and life. My grandfather was a great poetry lover. Some of you know I like to quote poetry. This one poem that some of you have heard several times, but excuse me, but it went something like this. He was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer scarce thought it worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I offered, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, now two, only two, two dollars, and who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice going for three. But no, 
From the room far back, an old gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow, brushing the dust from the old violin, tightening up the strings. He played a melody as pure and sweet, as sweet as the angels sing, and he laid it down. And the auctioneer, in a voice that was quiet and low, said, Now, what am I offered for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars! Who make it two? Two thousand, and who make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. And the people cheered. Some of them cried. They said, we don't understand. What changed its worth? The man replied, "'Twas the touch of the master's hand. Many a man with his life out of tune, who's been battered and scarred by sin, he's been auctioned off cheap to a thoughtless crowd, just like that old violin, a mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. And then the master comes by, and the thoughtless crowd never can quite understand the worth of that soul or the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Have you ever felt that touch in your life? Jack Moore felt it one time in an old stinking Korean prison cell. And thank God he responded to it. Oh, my friends, tonight, you Israel people, you people that believe in our country and believe in our race and believe in our God, get on fire with the Holy Spirit and go out as the soldiers that God wants you to be. Thank you and God bless you.